people for your patience. And thank you for logging in and attending, participating in our June 18th webinar where Katrina McDonald will be providing an update on appropriations and congressional engagement. Again, my name is Anna Post, and I'm the Director of External Relations and Council Communications at NCSS. For those of you not familiar with Kat, she is the President of Lynchman Strategies, LLC, a firm that specializes in federal legislative policy, strategy, and advocacy in the areas of education, health, and disability. Her extensive experience on the Hill is invaluable to NCSS. Thank you for being with us today, Kat. It's great to be here with everybody. And the most important part of my background is that I spent time between college and graduate school teaching 7th and 8th grade history and American governance. So this is an issue that's close to my heart, and it's exciting to be talking about this with all of you. So today we're going to be spending a little bit of time talking about engaging with members of Congress. And that's really timely because Congress is getting ready to come home for the summer district work periods. Between now and the election, members of Congress will be home far more than they will be in D.C., um, talking to constituents about issues that you care about. And it's a terrific time to engage with members of Congress. I want to pause um, before we dive into that and make two observations that I think are really important. The first is that, to a certain extent, all of the things that we're going to be talking about can be useful with members of Congress, but can also be useful with other elected officials who hold the fate of social studies in their hands. And whether it's a uh, member of the elected school board, excuse me, I have to forgive me, I have a little bit of a cold. Um, whether it's school board members, whether it's state legislators, all of the things that we talk about apply equally to state and local officials um, as well as to federal officials. The other thing is that we're going to talk about a range of activities. Some of the things that we will discuss obviously require support and buy-in or just plain permission from a board of education, from um, the leadership at a school, They're, they require more organization, they're higher profile, and um, you've got to have buy-in in order to make them work. And some of the things that we're going to talk about are simple things that you can do along with other members of your state council just as individual citizens. So there's a range of activities. They all help. They all contribute. They're all important. And if you can't do or get organized or get buy-in for the stuff that's bigger and splashier, that doesn't mean that you can't make a difference. So with those two um, important notes, let's dive in. We're going to begin with a quick update on where things stand on appropriations, because summer is usually appropriation season. There's been some progress since our last webinar. We want to give you um, a little bit of an update. So the first thing to know is that funding this year is extremely tight. Domestic spending under the Ryan and Murray budget agreement of about a year ago got no funding increase from 2014 to 2015. And of course, needs and claims on the budget have increased at the same time that funding allocations have remained the same. So on June 10th, the Senate Labor, Health, and Human Services Subcommittee held its markup. That's the opportunity for subcommittee members to get together to look at the proposal made by Chairman Harkin of Iowa to propose amendments and pass the bill on for the next stage in the process. Um, that bill was voted out of committee. In advance of the markup, we got a number of questions from committee staff about civic education particularly social studies education more broadly, but really mostly focused on civic education funding. Um, we communicated with them our appreciation for the shout out to civics in the SEED program in the 2014 budget, and also communicated to them our concerns about the ways in which the requirements for SEED funding um, are not necessarily a great fit for civics. And so they asked a lot of questions about a number of other funding sources, 
and it seemed that they were really engaged in trying to help solve that problem. But we don't know what they were able to come up with because uh, the, the bill was marked up on June 10th. It was not made public. Uh, the announced plan was to go to the full committee markup. That's the second stage in the process on June 12th. And then once it was passed through the full committee, the bill would be made public and it would be prepared to go to the floor. So um, that Senate markup has been postponed. We don't yet know when it will be rescheduled for. And so we're sort of on tenderhooks uh, waiting to hear what might have been done for civic education in the Senate bill. Um, and we will have to wait until it moves to the full committee markup in order to see the bill and the report language. On the House side, the timing of the appropriations bill is still uncertain. Um, the chairman of the full appropriations committee, Hal Rogers of Kentucky, is saying that he does want to move all bills through the committee process. The chairman of the subcommittee, Jack Kingston, um, is a Senate candidate in Georgia, and it's unclear um, when that subcommittee will move forward with its bill. So that is the state of play of the current appropriations process. It's exciting and a little nerve-wracking. Um, and I'll also add a quick update on the seed language. So just as a reminder, in the 2014 bill, there was a shout out to civics in the section of the bill of the report language that described the seed program. And Congress pointed out that um, civic education applicants could apply for seed funding. That was the first time in a number of years that an appropriations bill has uh, made an explicit mention of one of the disciplines of the social studies, and it was very exciting. Um, the grants uh, announcement with the criteria for those seed grants has not yet been released. Um, the money that was provided in the 2014 bill is two-year money. It's not one-year money. So they do not have to get this out before the end of the federal fiscal year on the 30th of September. And we will continue to update people as we get more information. So let's uh, talk about engaging with members of Congress and their staff, unless folks have questions that they would like to type out and send on the chat room. In the absence of those yet, um, I'm going to keep going. But if you do have questions about the appropriations process, um, please do go ahead and, and send them. So as we know, 2014 is an election year. Um, there was a shockwave that went through Congress a couple of, uh, like it's last week, um, when Senate Majority Leader Eric Cantor lost his primary. It's the first time since the late 1800s that a sitting majority leader has been defeated in a primary. And there's a lot of debate about what lessons Congress should take away from his defeat. But conventional wisdom seems to be coalescing around the idea um, that Majority Leader Cantor lost his election because he was too focused on national politics and his leadership job and failed to stay closely in touch with voters back home. So that is a message that Republicans and Democrats are taking to heart. And with only a few legislative bills left in this calendar year, members of Congress are spending time at home. They want to be out and about. They want to do meet and greets. They want to listen to constituents. And it's a great opportunity to take advantage of their time in your district. So that should be happening in two different ways. And I'm going to talk both about um, planning now for the fall and things that you might be able to do once school starts again. And then we'll talk separately about opportunities over the summer between now and when school starts up. So there are a lot of activities that you can undertake, um, again, with a little bit of support from um, schools or that teachers can undertake with support from schools. And Anna, if you'd like to go on to the next slide. Um, and they require a little planning um, and advanced preparation and uh, getting on a member's schedule. But 
plenty to do if they're with a little advanced um, thought. So just as examples, and I know that when I'm done laying out a few ideas, we're going to have some other participants um, hop on the phone and talk about things that they have done and ways that they engaged in um, outreach to members of Congress. But teachers can invite a member of Congress to speak to a civics history or a social studies class. You can plan an activity where students write their member of Congress about things that concern them in their community or what they would like to change. And again, it doesn't have to be overtly political, but um, having it be an election year is a great learning opportunity, opportunities for civic engagement. Um, invite a member of Congress or their staff to judge a debate or a project presentation or to speak at a school assembly or even just visit a high school class. Um, School newspapers are a great way to engage with members of Congress, and school newspapers can request an interview with the school, uh, with the member of Congress, and have students submit questions about things that they're concerned about, and give members of Congress the opportunity to respond to student-generated questions. If you really got a campus that's excited about this, you can host the candidate debate at the school. Even though that's political, as long as the candidates are um, invited, all of them, um, you can have somebody come and speak. You can have folks come and debate. And students can generate questions. Students can even be the ones who moderate the debate and ask the questions, as long as it's um, even-handed. So I know. Folks on the phone will um, have lots of other suggestions and ideas about things that you can do. Um, and we'll talk about those in greater detail in just a couple of minutes. But I also want to remind folks that you don't want to wait until fall. And there are some great opportunities to meet up with members, talk to members, um, and sort of elevate the profile of the social studies over the summer. As I said, members of Congress are back in town. Many of them use summer months to do very low dollar fundraisers. 10 bucks, 20 bucks can get you into the hot dog roast or the bowl roast or the corn on the cob roast. And the goal of doing those is really much less to raise money and more to have an opportunity to talk with folks. There are a lot of town hall meetings going on. Members want to be out in the community hearing from people. Um, sometimes it can be a little difficult to get information about when a member of Congress is going to be making a public appearance. Since Gabby Gifford was shot a couple of years ago, some people are more cautious about making their public schedules public. Um, but if you call a congressional office and say that you're a constituent, you live in the district, and you'd like to know if there are going to be opportunities to talk with a member of Congress at a um, town hall meeting, then often they will take an address and put you on a list so that you can get an email notice when the member will be in your area. County fairs are a great opportunity to elevate issues and to see members of Congress. They like to go and just walk around. Um, <clears throat> having a little booth um, that talks about civic education, social studies, promoting democracy uh, can be a really fun activity. Um, Independence Day parades. Lots of folks look for uh, groups that are willing to march in the parade. And a social studies related group would be a terrific group to march in the parade, have a couple of signs and banners talking about Independence Day and our democracy and how important the teaching of social studies is to preserving democracy. And you can come up with some great slogans for the signs. And if you can't march in the Independence Day parade, you can get a group of students or a group of teachers to make a couple of signs and stand by the side of the parade. And many members of Congress like to be in those parades, and they can see your signs as you're standing by the side of the road. You can schedule meetings in the home office when members are in town. You can write letters to the editor um, that are tied to community events. You want to make sure that you do that in a way that elevates the likelihood that your letter will be published. 
And just so you know, generally letters to the editor need to be 500 words or less. Some only publish letters that are 250 words or less. And many of them have a stated policy on the editorial page that will let you know, or on the website, they'll let you know um, how the, what the acceptable length is. Um, you want to tie your message about the importance of social studies to a current event. You know, I was in Los Angeles two weeks ago, and there were two front page newspaper articles on uh, in the Los Angeles Times talking about students getting engaged in current events. And it was such a great example of civic engagement and civic education. Um, I would have loved to have seen in the paper the next day a couple of um, folks writing letters to the editor pointing that out and talking about why this is important. Your letter must be timely. So you can't always drop everything and write a letter, but if there is a current event that you can tie to civic education, uh, typically the newspaper needs to receive your letter within 24 hours and don't drop it in the mailbox anymore. Um, fax it or email it. Most uh, newspapers are accepting letters to the editor only by email, but some are still taking them by fax, and you want to make sure that you've written your letter to the editor in a timely way and gotten it to them in a timely way. So those are lots of opportunities to get your message out there to engage with members of Congress and other elected officials when they're home. If you do have an opportunity for a handshake at the county fair and to exchange three sentences with an elected official, you want to make sure that you are prepared. So create a short list of talking points, your elevator speech. If you've got 60 seconds to say civic education or social studies is important in our community because you want to know what you would say. If you get your 60 seconds in the elevator at the county fair, what are you going to talk about? Your 60 seconds might be, it's a travesty that the Board of Education is considering eliminating civic education and engaging our students in democracy as a graduation requirement. Or your 60 seconds might be businesses re rely on schools to teach students critical thinking, and one of the best ways to do that is social studies education. Whatever your message is, have it ready. Remember your audience when you're drafting that message, when you're developing your talking points. What policy or other interests does the member care about most, and how is social studies education related to those interests? The more you can tie your message about social studies honestly and correctly to something that an elected official cares about, the more likely they are to hear you. If you can't get to a member of Congress, remember, as we discussed on the webinar last week, sorry, last month, um, sometimes it's easier to start with the staff, and that's okay. Um, you can invite the district director to come out instead of the member, or if the member is unavailable. You can set up a meeting with the district staff if the member can't sit down with you. And again, all of these suggestions work with local elected officials and school board members as well as federal officials. So one more point to make before I turn this over to the real experts um, out in the states who are going to talk about how they engage with their elected officials. Um, but again, all of us, you might be a social studies teacher, you might be a social studies administrator, we're all private citizens. And we all have the right to talk with elected officials about things that we care about in our private capacity, even if we cannot do that in our professional capacity because of restrictions that are placed on us by the institutions in which we work. So obviously, and just to briefly repeat, <laughs> excuse me, some of these questions require support or permission from the school administration. That official support um, amplifies your advocacy, makes it more powerful, exposes members of Congress to more students, staff, and families. Um, you know, there's lots of things going for this, but they require more work and more organization. So if you can't do that, if you can't get agreement from your leadership, if there are other budgetary and other constraints, there's still a lot you can do as a private citizen. Send an email to your congressional delegation. 
ask a question at a fundraiser or a town hall meeting, hold a poster at the parade, write the letter to the editor, encourage your friends and families to um, advocate with you. There's a lot that you can do, and all of it helps. So with that, I'm going to stop, and if there aren't any questions, I am going to be on mute and looking forward uh, to input from other folks on the webinar. This wonderful, a wonderful overview and uh, encouragement for engaging with your congressional representatives over the summer. Uh, starting now, I guess we are in summer finally here from D.C. Um, is there anyone that would like to volunteer first to talk about how they have worked on building those relationships with their members of Congress and their the offices of those members? Uh, and uh, or a specific uh, instances in which you use some of these strategies and how you went about it. Uh, let's see. Would you let's see? Let me go ahead to Andrew Potter, and also let me introduce Andrew. Andrew is our current uh, chair of the Government Relations and uh, Public Relations Committee of NCSS. And he, he is the chair until June 30th, but we're so pleased to have him. Let me uh, unmute him so that he can tell us a little bit about his efforts. Thank you, Andrew. I think you're ready. Great. Uh, I hope that I can uh, be heard. Uh, I hope I'm coming across loud and clear. Um, yeah, I'll just share uh, some of the things that we've done. And uh, myself and my, time, my, my team, just so you know, we work primarily at the federal level. Uh, and uh, primarily, uh, rather than focusing on specific pieces of legislation with, with the corporation that I'm currently employed by, uh, we spend most of our focus building long-term relationships uh, with the men members and their staff. And uh, the one the one thing that I would share is just kind of the, the internal mantra that we've developed through the years that, that guides this relationship building is, is what we call the three E's, uh, engage, equip, and empower. Uh, and those are the three things that, that we look to focus on in each one of our meetings uh, with the member. And even though this is at the federal level, I think you could probably apply some things that you think might work at the state level. Uh, on, on the engaged side, what, what we mean by that is we want to provide long-term professional dialogue. Uh, we, we eventually want to be seen as a resource that, that they can contact for more information. Uh, from the equipping side, uh, we're, we're constantly working to provide insight, provide information, updates, alerts, uh, as it relates to issues that, that we are concerned about. Uh, and from the empower side, the, the primary thing that, that we really focus on is, is, is actually providing solutions. Uh, so we're not just simply going to members and saying, help us with money or provide this or provide that, but we actually want to provide them ways uh, and, and means that they can pursue to actually uh, achieve the ends uh, that, that, that we would like to see completed. And so that's, that's just one example of, of a way that, that we've been using through the years. We found it to be uh, fairly successful. Uh, but I'm sure that there are you know, different ways to do it. I think that's so so nicely put, so succinct, uh, and it encompasses uh, the basic core of what uh, those relationship building efforts uh, should be or ideally would be. Let me uh, try and see if um, I believe uh, Ken DeMassey uh, from Arizona would be uh, available to speak to his efforts in Arizona. Can I am. I am. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, good. Yes. Glad to be here with everybody today. Um, some of our experiences in Arizona with the council uh, overlap, in a sense, with two of our affiliate organizations. Uh, one is the Arizona Geographic Alliance, and the other is the Arizona Council for Economic Education. And in Arizona. I'm sure we're not the only state like this, but we have um, I, I'm, a focus on both federal and state. We're so far from Washington, D.C., that the only time we really get to talk to 
the uh, federal legislators is either through email or when they do visit, uh, and there's not a um, hardcore group of of 100 um, uh, folks that have a very, very interesting agenda. Uh, some of you may know that we have, uh, in Arizona, we have nine uh, congressmen. Five are Democrats, which is unusual for us, and four Republican. The National Geographic Society had a, um, a great opportunity for advocacy on the Hill in February, and Anna was part of that, too. Um, well, we got to actually talk with our legislators. In most cases, we had appointments already set. In some cases, uh, they ditched out. Our, our two senators um, uh, found themselves hard, hard to find, even though they had promised to be there. Um, but one of our <coughs> one of our legislators, Matt Salmon, who actually served uh, previous in Congress and uh, had run on the campaign uh, uh, promise that he would only serve three terms. And he did, and then he left, and uh, he did other things, and then got elected again this last time, and, and of course is up for election again. At the same time that we were in Washington, D.C., there were three of us who also served on the Arizona Council, the Social Studies Board, were actively involved in the state legislature uh, with a particular funding, two funding bills, one for the Arizona Geographic Alliance, the other for the uh, economics folks. And uh, Matt Salmon told us when we were pushing for the NCSS-supported uh, uh, legislation and NGS-supported uh, legislation that he didn't favor any federal monies going into those things unless they were block grants to the state. And we said, well, this is going to work out really nice because that's exactly what our state legislators are asking for. Um, he promised, we learned through his, uh, one of his office staff, happens to be the daughter and a former student of, of um, one of my colleagues, uh, is the daughter of our state Senate president. And uh, they promised to work on him. And he was the stumbling block. Our legislation did not pass, and he's primarily the reason why. So we, we have some work to do, but we've learned a lot about how to develop relationships with uh, people that don't share any or virtually none of our political views, uh, both personally and professionally. They seem to be opposed to education in Arizona in general. Uh, <laughs> and specifically funding for economics and geography, even though we, we did not meet a single one of our state legislators that, that said anything negative about either of those things. They felt like those are, those are absolutely crucial to what we do in education, and yet uh, they didn't want to put a few bucks into it. Um, Thank you. We, we started... Let me just say how we went about the relationship building. We started by, by making some cold calls um, to folks that probably didn't even know that we existed. And we had put together uh, packets of information about things that we had done, um, things that we sponsor, workshops, conferences, all of the different schools that were involved with some of our activities, our um, our outlook, our 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 broad approach to to uh, geography education and economics education, and we found that when we provided that information on these cold calls to the legislators, that the very next week when we returned, many of them had gone through the material. Sometimes they'd gone through it to be helped of, of their administrative assistant or whoever we might have talked to first. And sometimes it was just the fact that we had some really interesting maps and uh, freebies that we provided for them, and they liked that. And <clears throat> again, we did find a few folks that were willing to to uh, support us, but we didn't we didn't get the um, we didn't get to that critical mass. 
Um, and it was a long, drawn-out process, and we discovered, I'm not sure how anyone else is, uh, where anyone else is on this at the state level, but we found that really the, the folks that are carrying the, the blunt of lobbying from the teaching ranks are primarily those that are retired. Uh, people can't leave their classroom to go down to the state legislature and, and uh, walk the halls. And they certainly can't fly to Washington, D.C. That's our experience That's in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, let me just uh, tell you some of the things that that uh, impressed were impressed upon me by your what you were telling us. One is that you really did study, your, you and your group studied very well uh, who were your uh, members of Congress in your district at the state level, um, at the federal level, and so on. And so you knew who you were uh, going to be uh, doing outreach to and what their views were, and that's, that's really important. You also uh, mentioned that um, you did research and found out, I'm sure fairly quickly from even just uh, visiting with them, that some of them were hardcore against any federal monies uh, being shared uh, for education purposes at the state level and um, from the federal level to the state level and uh, believers in, in block grants and that that required a particular strategy um, and of course you also are saying uh, that while you didn't were not able to uh, Make uh, to to get enough uh, to enough support to get it, make a difference and to meet your goals that you are in some ways moving the needle and I think that's a very important outcome that we should not expect that uh, through our efforts um, we will make everything change immediately. Uh, we have to measure success in increments and uh, measure out or set out our goals in, in smaller increments so that we don't want to discourage those that are following our footsteps in advocating for particular legislation and changes towards the betterment and funding of social studies, but uh, that we increase, that we keep people going um, after that goal that final goal with incremental goals. Uh, thanks so much, Ken. I, let, me, let me add one more thing, if I might. Sure. Uh, we did hold on uh, May 10th, it was an all-day uh, Saturday event, for those that were interested in learning more about advocacy, we held an all-day event. We, we actually hired uh, the state lobbyists from the Arizona Education Association, who we're friends with, uh, to come in and facilitate a part of this program about uh, lobbying basis, Hello? a guide to testifying. Ken, your sound is out. Okay, it looks like my uh, microphone is turned off. Uh, Ken, we'll come back to you because okay. I cannot hear you at all. I'm so sorry about that. Let me go ahead and since I see that Andy has uh, typed something up in the chat, I would love for you to speak about that a little bit more, Andy. Go ahead, Andy. Andy? Can everyone hear Andy? Andy? Well, let's, let's uh, just keep Andy's um, text information in mind. And let me go ahead to Peggy Jackson from New Mexico, who I know um, is very active in engaging her members of Congress. Peggy, you're on the mic. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I got in late, um, driving back like um, a little bit fast from Albuquerque out to my um, acreage in the East Mountains. Um, I want to say two things. I heard Andrew Potter 
uh, and I agree completely with him, it is about building long-term relationships. And what I'd like to concentrate on is connections. Connections, connections, connections. In every er area that we can be, not just in their space when we're on the hill, but in an email, I have a really good relationship with both my senators and my representative. And I think probably it's because I email them every month. I find the educational aid that works most uh, closely with my senators. And I do have one who is very supportive, or at least a little, little bit more so, and the other who believes that federal dollars, uh, we need to use state dollars. Once I sit and explain where we are in our state, I finally got them around as well, and both Senator Udall and Senator Heinrich did support our $30 million for civic learning that will be in FY15. I'm excited about that, and it took a lot of time and effort. Quickly, um, I also agree with uh, what Ken just said about, or uh, maybe it was Andrew that said we try, it was Andrew, uh, we try to engage, to equip, and to empower uh, lobbyists. And we're not lobbyists, we are advocates. We have a great lobbyist in CAT, but she has trained us so much how to go in and advocate for ourselves. And, and it's surprising. They really want to hear from us because, after all, we're their constituents. When, we, when I go to the office, uh, I had some bad experiences eventually, uh, in the very beginning, initially, because I always would want to see who I was supposed to see. And sometimes we don't always see who we're supposed to see. So the most important thing, I think, is just being gracious with whoever they say, this is who you're going to see today. Oh, I'm so excited. My name is Peggy. And go from there and not be disappointed that it might be a different person. Fortunately, I usually get to see the educational uh, legislative aides to both my senators. And that's important because they are the ones who actually go back. How we had success last year in appropriations is just going back and going back and going back and saying the same song with a different verse in a different way. How, what is going on in New Mexico? How we are not having state dollars for anything but state testing? how we have to have some federal dollars to come into our state with uh, civic education and civic learning. And that's been the way that we have accomplished it. Not only do I email every month, I try to put a tidbit in what is happening. Uh, I am semi-retired. I am still working part-time in my district. And I'm mentoring National Board teachers in five districts in our state. So I have a lot of contact with teachers and students. And so I try to put a tidbit in of what's actually happening in, our, in the classroom. And that always gets their attention when you can talk about, this is the classroom teacher who is doing yada yada. This is what I observed when I was in the classroom watching this teacher I saw the students doing this, when you can give specific examples. The other thing is that it's usually good not only to send an email, but I always, if I've been on the Hill in anybody's office, I write a personal thank you note. I am still a letter writer. I, am still, I still write handwritten thank you notes, and I still believe in them. And I can tell you that they still like getting them. It may take two weeks to get there, but it's important that they see the written word. I know Senator Udall has thanked me personally. You don't know, Peggy, what those written thank you notes mean to us. We keep them. And they certainly keep emails, but a lot of times the written word that is in front of them that's tangible helps. Um, when when some leadership cat's going to talk to us again? Um, I don't know. I got on the call late, but I don't know if she talked about Senator Harkin's uh, appropriations bill or not. 
but I know uh, it will be probably after the elections before we get a lot done, but we may be able to get some of that appropriation money tied up in the fall before, uh, before certainly before our, uh, we meet with them in uh, September. Um, can you bring me up to speed, Anna, with what any, did she say anything about Senator Harkins' bill? Unfortunately, she did not say specifically anything about Senator Harkins' bill. What she did talk about is that the appropriations process was on hold um, for, that the, the markup had been postponed. And so it's not clear when it will be scheduled and so that the information that had already been discussed um, was not made public and so we don't know anything. And so that was okay. That's, that's what I wanted to know because the mock-up was supposed to be June 6th and Fern Goodhart is on that appropriations committee. And so right. she'll be, and so I, when I see her at summer leadership, I have appointments with both of my senators, educational people, as well as in uh, my representative's office. If I have time, one quick thing. In New Mexico, it's hard to get anything done in the state house because here all of our monies come directly from the state to the district. And for that reason, um, it's one for all, all for one. It's an equal education state. And it's not funded like Arizona or California or any, there's only three states that are funded like we are. And right now the big argument is about uh, testing and tying a standardized test to teacher evaluation. So being able to do like in Connecticut, I'm so excited to see what they've done there to get a consultant in uh, social studies finally again. We have been working on that, but at the local level, it's really hard to do. And I think it's a little bit more political because everything does come straight from even our teacher salaries. Everything comes from the state legislature to the local district, and then it's appropriated. Thank you for asking me to make comments, and if there's any questions, I'll be glad to field them. Thank you, Peggy. That's I greatly appreciate it. And Peggy is also our Vice President-Elect of NCSS. I just wanted to say that she has uh, worked for many years to establish relationships with all, with, with all of her members of Congress um, at the federal level. And I'm sure at the state level, she also has connections because she's been building those relationships, I think, for years. Um, she has great experience, and she will be speaking at the Summer Leadership Institute doing a brief role play there. Um, so thanks again, Peggy. I wanted to turn um, my attention to some chat information that Andy Demko submitted. He was next on my list, but he's telling me that he's having mic problems. So uh, let me go ahead and read what he's saying. He is also he is an NCSS board member. And uh, he is very active in his state, uh, and what he's been doing lately is inviting their local state representatives and state senators to their school for social studies events, and that it's been great to see that the state rep um, at school events in Rainier, uh, that they actually do attend. Um, and, for example, he says, Rainier visited, revisited living history event and Charles E. Fox sign ceremony. Uh, Roll Kappa members, which is NCSS's National Social Studies Honor Society, uh, those members are being honored at the city council meeting. So he's establishing a lot of connections with uh, the local district, state level leaders and decision makers, and that's um, also a very important part of building relationships. Um, they have to be built at various levels. It, it shouldn't be just at the federal level. It should go from, you know, anywhere to local, district, state, and then federal or the other way around. Um, in addition, Andy tells us that next week uh, there will be a history club student and parent uh, and himself will be meeting with their Oregon U.S. Senators to talk about hometown heroes. 
which must be a program that he um, implements at school or after school. Um, he says that he agrees with Peggy that it is connections and connections uh, that help these relationships get established and that help you become a resource, that help you become uh, someone that will be sought out when the member of Congress wants to know, to get a, a sense of what's going on on the ground with educators in social studies and you are one of their resources um, that is, you know, because you've been in touch with them and they know you uh, for some time at those offices. So uh, following up, he says with thank you cards, it is, is important after each meeting and keeping in touch as well. Um, at any rate, I think that was all that Andy, Andy shared. I wanted to go back to Ken for one minute just to um, make sure that we caught the last part of what he was saying, something about, I believe, a, uh, a consultant. Um, Ken, I don't know if you would like to try it again. Can you, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly now. Okay. Uh, what I said is that uh, on May 10th, Saturday, May 10th, we had a full-day advocacy training for those members of the council that wanted to learn more about um, our efforts at the state legislature, but advocacy in general. And we actually hired uh, a lobbyist from the Arizona Education Association who is very familiar with the legislature to give us some tips on how we might do this better next year. Um, we actually started our, our lobbying practice uh, a year ago with a um, with a, a bill that we got sponsored. Uh, it didn't get very far last year. We tried it again this year. We got right up to the very, very end, they, just uh, in the last few hours of the of the hundredth day, which is their their limit, um, and it it did not pass. But we learned an awful lot about what. Um, Andrew was saying in developing relationships. Unfortunately, a lot of those folks that, that we uh, developed a good relationship with are either moving on to a different office or are no longer running this year. And we now have to wait till the end of, of um, August when the uh, primary is held here to find out who's likely to be in office. If, uh, we, we have, a uh, for the most part, a one-party state. And uh, once you find out who wins the primary, you pretty much have an idea who's going to be in the state, uh, in state House and State Senate. In uh, three weeks from now, on uh, July 10th, 11th, and 12th, we're holding a three-day conference for, uh, where we're going to specifically lay out, again, what we did in that full-day advocacy training lobbying basics, guides to testifying at, at, uh, before the legislature, um, talking about how you make initial contact, how you develop a friendship in a sense with your state legislator, even though they may not be in your political party. Um, maybe other states, and I, I assume New Mexico is similar to this, um, Sometimes a state legislator will not meet with you if you are not a constituent. And even less so, perhaps, if you're not a constituent and you're not in their political party. How they find out whether you're in their political party or not, I don't know. But we also had a whole new tool that other states might want to look at this year. It was uh, started by a state senator and our sec state secretary of our state um, Secretary of State, who is now running for the governorship, and it's called Arizona Voices, and it allows any citizen of Arizona using either their driver's license ID or their voter registration to go online and to look up particular bills and to, to um, state support for them, uh, explain, give reasons. And it started off fairly slowly, but we really managed to get about 150 of our our, um, our members in the state to actually sign up. And we found that we actually moved the 
the barometer of support for our bills uh, quite quite a distance. The only thing we were lacking, of course, is getting the state legislators that we were trying to move to take heed of that. Now, as more legislators begin to notice that there is an electronic um, there is an electronic means for for uh, for uh, citizens to make contact with them, other than a, a simple straightforward email, but actually to to show there's widespread support out there for certain legislation. Uh, maybe it'll have more value. Uh, we're certainly going to use that to our advantage if, if, it, uh, if, it, if it proves to be any kind of an advantage, but we're certainly getting more, more sophisticated in how to use that. It's been a long learning curve. Yeah, <laughs> it also is, I think. Um, thank you so much, Ken. I appreciate you sharing this additional piece. Thank you very much for your participation.